reminds me that um, um, we are watching a video. <laughs> Praise God. And as we um, take in the word in this, every now and then, we have no choice in this. There may come an advertisement. And they're going <laughs> to... And so they're going to try to mute it or whatever when we get to that point. But just so you'll be forewarned. It's like, we didn't plan it that way. It's just that that's part of the program. So... So I wanted to, it's Rick Renner, and he's a Greek scholar. And so with what we've been talking about, um, it was two years ago um, I had uh, our ladies' meeting watch this. It's not the exact one, but it's the same teaching. And so it's, it's very impactful. It's very powerful. Um, and so I believe it, it will just truly minister um, to each of us. You know, that's a wonderful thing. Even in the song that we just sang, you know, he knows our name. He's so personal. He's such a personal God. He loves us so much. Um, and so I just, that's why I have us watching this um, tonight. So kind of put your thinking caps on because he really um, goes into detail and explains. Yes, he really, really does. But this is going to help us. It's going to help you, honestly, to learn what you're going to learn tonight is going to help you for the rest of your life. I'm telling you. Wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like what I was saying in the beginning. He's, he loves us so much. He gave us everything that we need. And so a lot of time. I mean, it was a huge day in my life when I found out that there was something I could do. I didn't have to just sit around and wait on God and wonder why he was so slow in moving or whatever I was thinking at the time. He gave me things in the word that I could do to it says, partake of that divine life. That's what it says. We partake of the divine life because we learn about him through his precious promises that he gave us. And so that's part of this equipping that, that he's teaching on. And one of the things that, one of my favorite things about this teacher um, is that he's not only an awesome teacher, he's brilliant, but he also takes it, it's not just learning, he takes it to a practical application. And so we can do it like Pastor Angie said, the rest of our life. That's what, and we can teach our kids. We can teach everyone around us. It's, it's like something to combat. God's got a fabulous plan for us, and um, the enemy tries to derail it. So this is just, we're more than equipped. Praise God. He's more than enough, and he, he made us more than equipped because he's in us. So praise God. That's what we're watching tonight, so you can be seated. And, and let's just pray also. You can be seated, and we'll pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your good plans. We love you, Lord God, and we're so glad you do know our name. You know us intimately. You know us, and we're yours. That's, that's amazing, Lord God. We're yours. We love you, and we thank you, and we open up to what you have for us. We open our hearts to you. You are only for our good. Everything you do is for our good. And so we open up to you, and we're going to learn everything you have for us. And you're going to show us, Holy Spirit, how to apply that. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. going to begin in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. And we're going to go pretty quick in this message. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the who? Devil. Today I want to talk to you about how the devil operates. I want to unravel the mystery of about how he attacks people. Because if you understand how the enemy operates, then you can recognize his operation. And if you understand it explicitly, then you can understand where you are in the process if you are under attack. And there are five basic words in the New Testament that if you comprehend these five words, you will understand everything about how the enemy operates. And so today, I want you to write down these five words. Number one, the name devil. And we'll be coming back to every one of these in just a moment. Number two, the word wiles. Number three, the word stronghold. Number four, the word oppression. 
And number five, the word deception. These five words tell you everything about how the devil operates. Now, there is one thing about the devil. The devil is not creative. He just replicates the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. If you see how he has attacked men for 6,000 years, it is the same thing he does over and over. How adultery takes place, it is the same thing over and over. Financial collapse in a person's life, the destruction of a marriage, all of it fits into these five steps. And so today, take careful notes. We begin with number one, the name devil. The word devil is the Greek word diabolos. It is spelled like this. It is actually not a name. His name is Satan. The word Satan means to slander or to accuse. We call him the devil, but in fact, the word diabolos, translated devil, is not a proper name. It is a job description. It describes his procedure, how he operates. And in fact, it is the word balos, from the Greek word balo, which means to throw something like a ball or to throw a rock. The front of the word has the prefix dia, and the word dia means to penetrate one thing from one side all the way through to the other side. So when you compound the two words together, Satan acts diabolos. He comes with accusations. That's who he is. He is Satan. He is the accuser. But his action is diabolos. He takes those accusations. He takes lies. He takes slander. And balos, like a stone or a ball or a rock, he begins slinging them against the mind. Slinging them against the mind. And in fact, this is repetitive, which tells us the devil knows hitting our mind once will not do the job. So he hits the mind and hits the mind and hits the mind and hits the mind and hits the mind until finally, dia, he begins to weaken the mind and finally penetrates it from one side all the way to the other. We have to understand, foundationally, that there are voices speaking to us all the time. The voice of God is trying to speak to us through the Bible. The devil is trying to speak to us. And the devil may not speak directly to us. He may bring in reinforcements. I'll illustrate this for you in just a moment. He may bring in a teacher from school. He may bring in a relative who says something ugly. Or the devil may use an experience to reinforce what he says. But the devil understands that whoever controls your mind will control you. Because whoever controls your mind controls your emotions. Whoever controls your emotions dictates how you project yourself to others. And the devil understands if he can penetrate the mind and take it fully, then he can dictate the destiny of your life. And God understands the same thing. And that is why God tells us to renew our minds with the Word of God. God knows, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And these voices are coming to us all the time, and we have to make a decision which voice we are going to listen to. If we listen to the enemy, then probably we are going to be penetrated. But if we close our vo ears to the voice of the enemy and open our voice to the Word of God, then God will begin to penetrate our mind, and God will begin to build a godly stronghold in our minds. There are different kinds of strongholds. You can have a godly stronghold in your mind. But we find that the devil comes with slanderous accusations and diabolos. He begins to strike and strike and strike and strike until finally, dia, he penetrates the mind. Then we come to the word wiles. The word wiles is the Greek word mythodas. It is a compound of the word meta and the word odas. Can anybody guess what the word odas is? You have an odometer in your car, right? 
Odometer comes from this word odas. It's the word for a road. The word meta means with. When you compound them together, they form the word methodas. It means to operate with a road, a road, or a single lane or a single avenue, which means the devil does not have many different tricks in his bag. He primarily has one avenue of attack, and this is very important, because roads go somewhere. And if the devil is operating on a road, then you need to know where is he going? Where is he headed? And we've already seen the devil understands his objective is the mind. So he comes directly to the mind, operating on an avenue directed straight to the mind, straight to the emotions, where he begins striking and striking and striking and striking until finally he penetrates. And if the devil penetrates the mind, he then begins to build a stronghold. The word stronghold is the Greek word ukras. You can find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 where Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That word strongholds is this word ukras. It really carries two ideas, and both of them are correct. In the first place, the word stronghold, the Greek word ukras, describes a prison. Well, a prison is something that keeps you behind bars. You can see out into freedom, but you are not free. And when a person has a stronghold, a lie that is working in their mind, the devil has penetrated their mind for example, and has said to a very talented singer, your gifts are not as good as someone else. And that lie enslaves them, so they sit in their seats, like behind prison bars, as they watch someone else sing, knowing in themselves their voice is better, their talent is greater, but they sit enslaved because of a lie that says, you can't do that, you don't got the confidence to do that, you're not as talented as them, nobody will like you, and this lie literally enslaves a gift that is fabulous. It's invisible, but it is a real prison. But this word stronghold, ukras, can also describe a castle or a fortress. Well, Denise and I live in Moscow. And the very heart of Moscow is, anybody know? It's the Kremlin. The word Kremlin means fortress. Why did they build the Kremlin? Why do you build any fortress? Because back in those days, you wanted to keep people on the outside. A prison is designed to keep you on the inside, but a fortress is designed to keep people on the outside. It doesn't matter how hard they bash the walls. The walls are so thick and so defended, the people on the outside cannot seem to penetrate. And likewise, when a person has a mental stronghold, Someone can speak to them and tell them the truth. And the person with the stronghold will even say, I know that you're telling me the truth, but it's as though they're behind walls. And even though truth is coming at them from every direction, they can't seem to hear the truth. They can't receive it because there is such a well-defended lie that has now been constructed in their minds. And as a pastor, I have noticed through the years that people can have a stronghold in one part of their mind, but not in the rest of their mind. They can be bound in the area of finances, or they can be bound in the area of their self-image. They can be bound in one area, but free in other areas. But you need to understand the devil is never satisfied just to have one area. Once he gets a foothold, he then begins to extend his tentacles in order to take more territory. Both God and the devil are territorial. They both want more. Then you come to the word oppression, and the word oppression is found in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Anybody know what it says? 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and what? Healing all who were what? Oppressed. Everybody say oppressed. All who were oppressed. What, what does it say? All who were oppressed of the devil. Well, the word oppression is the word kata, which describes something that is subjugating or dominating. The second part of the word is the word dunamis. It's where we get the word power. But when you compound the two words together, the Greek word for oppression describes a power that is subjugating, a power that is oppressive, or a power that is depressing someone. It's holding them down. And in fact, the word oppression is the identical word for a tyrant or a wicked king. A tyrant or a wicked king. Well, according to our understanding, where do most wicked kings live? They live in fortresses. So now we find that once the enemy has built a stronghold in the mind, he finds a comfortable place where he sits and begins to speak to us and oppress us, tell us what we will think. He dictates to us how we will feel, what will happen with our marriage, taking this lofty position, suppressing, subjugating, holding us down. And then finally, we come to word number five. I told you this would be fast. This word is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where the Apostle Paul says, we are not ignorant of Satan's... Praise God, it's so good to be with a church that knows the Bible. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. The word devices is the word noose. The word noose is the word for the brain. It literally means the brain or the mind. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the form changes and it becomes the word noe mata. When noose becomes noe mata, it's no longer just a brain. But I say it is scrambled brains. It is a brain that has been penetrated and hit from so many angles. It has heard so many voices that it is deceived. It no longer has the ability to perceive what is right and what is wrong because it has been penetrated. In fact, it might hear a lie and believe a lie to be the truth. It might hear the truth and say, that could never be for me. The mind is totally deceived. And this is the end result. And when this takes place, you are taken captive. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration from my life. I've learned through the years it's better to talk about yourself than it is to talk about somebody else. When I was a young man, I was strange. There's no doubt about it. I was a very strange young man. I didn't like to do any of the things that other people did. We were in a Baptist church, and 55 years ago, you know, today is my birthday. 55 years ago. Isn't that something? 55 years ago, everybody didn't even have a television. Everybody in my neighborhood didn't have a television. A lot of people were still listening to radio. I can remember when the first colored television came into our neighborhood. We all went to the neighbor's house to see what a colored television looks like. I remember that. Well, if you don't have televisions, what do you do? You sit on the front porch, you talk to your neighbors. I don't know if you've ever thought how technology has changed the world, but nobody sits on the front porch anymore. You know why? Because we have air conditioning. Back in those days, everybody sat on the front porch because it was cooler than sitting in a hot house, and that's how you got to know your neighbors. Everything has changed. We didn't have an air conditioner. We had a box fan. The a water cooler is what we had. Did you guys have water coolers? I mean, who had air conditioners? You'd have to be very rich to have an air conditioner. 
And we basically lived outside. We lived in the yard. We played outside. The church was very involved in sports. Sports. And I hated every kind of sports. And in our church, if you were a man, you liked sports. So my father, like all the other boys in our church, put me into basketball. To me, that was the most stupid, unintellectual thing any human being could do. To run around a sweaty room with a bunch of stinking guys trying to dribble a ball and throw it through a hole in the end of the room. I just did not get it. And I was no good at basketball. I hated it. So my father put me in baseball. Baseball. And I was an outfielder. What fun to stand there and just wait for some ball to come flying through the air, maybe in your direction. I was so bored, I would stand in the outfield and try to count four-leaf clovers. I was always looking for clovers. We have movies, home movies, of the baseball games with me sitting down looking for clovers while I'm supposed to be an outfielder. I have no interest in baseball whatsoever. And it made it worse because my father was a pitcher for a softball team. So I grew up at the softball field. Well, I couldn't do basketball. Couldn't do baseball. Ugh. So dad thought, okay, football. <sighs> you have got to be kidding me. Knock the snot out of people and call that fun. You think that's fun? Knock each other flat, mess up your head, your legs. What is fun about that? I just hated all of it. I just hated it. I was made different. I liked the symphony. I loved it. I can remember going to the symphony orchestra by myself, a 10-year-old boy sitting there with my ticket, waiting as the orchestra was tuning their instruments, looking around the room that there's no other 10 other children, old children here, wondering, what is wrong with me? Why am I the only 10-year-old in this entire auditorium? But I just loved it, and especially Tchaikovsky. I loved Tchaikovsky. I loved museums. Museums. Oh, culture. Oh. And every Tuesday night, I'd go to Philbrook Art Museum. And all the watercolorists from Tulsa that were professionals would come together and they would paint so spectators could watch their strokes. And every Tuesday night, I would follow the brush strokes of the painters, nearly hypnotized. I just loved art. And then I enrolled in art painting lessons. I didn't have any boyfriends my age taking art art lessons, oil lessons, but I was learning to do landscapes and portraits and still lives and oh, all that oil paint and brushes and oh, I was just lost in another world. I just loved that. My father would take me on fishing trips. Ugh, hated that. Hated that. <laughs> so dumb to me, just putting a line in the water and waiting for some fish to swim along and bite some fake bait that you put in the water. To me, it was just so stupid. And so instead of fishing, I brought my oil paints and an easel and canvas and set up the easel in the boat and would paint while everybody else fished. And all the other guys thought I was a little bit of a freak. And the devil would say to me, there's something wrong with you. 
I was so young, I didn't know the devil was speaking to me. I just thought it was my thoughts. There's something wrong with you. You're not like other people. There's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Then in the seventh grade, I became ill. And I missed one half of a school year. When I came back to school, I didn't understand anything they were saying about mathematics. I didn't understand any of the grammar they were teaching about English because I had missed six months of school and I felt like such an idiot and I would hear the devil speaking to me, you are so stupid, you are so stupid, you are so stupid, you don't like sports, you like art, you like Tchaikovsky, you like opera, you don't like any of these things, you can't understand English, you can't work math, you are just so stupid, there's something wrong with you. And every morning when I would look into that mirror in the seventh grade, in the morning to brush my teeth, I would look in that mirror and would say, I hate you. I hate you. There's something wrong with you. At the end of the seventh grade, they passed me just to be kind. So I started the eighth grade. But if I didn't understand the seventh grade, how was I going to understand the eighth grade? And so the problem was compounding. And once again, I didn't understand. And I would hear the devil say, there's something wrong with you. You're so stupid. Why can everyone else understand this? You're just so stupid. You're just so stupid. At the end of the eighth grade, they passed me to the ninth grade because they didn't want me to stay in the eighth grade. And so I went into the eighth grade. I'm starting to the ninth grade. And the ninth grade was algebra. Oh. If I didn't understand anything else, how am I going to understand algebra? I can recall the day walking up the steps to turn right into the algebra class shaking on the inside because I felt like such an idiot before I ever walked into the door. I knew before I ever got there I wouldn't understand anything the teacher would talk about. And when I sat in my seat, she began to call the roll. And when she came to my name, she called my father's name. She said, Ronald Renner? Well, that's my dad. My father had been in this same woman's algebra class. That's how old she was. In the same room she was teaching at the same desk, and for 30 years she held a grudge against my father because he smoked a pipe in her class, and she said he was a hoodlum. So when she called the name, she called my father's name. I said, ma'am, my name is Ricky Renner. She was wearing her glasses. They were down on the end of her nose. She looked at me. She strutted around the edge of that desk. She took those glasses off. She said, is your father Ronald Renner? I said, yes, ma'am, that's my father. I'm telling you before God, this is what happened. She looked at me and said, stupid. Stupid, stupid. I remember it just like today. She wore stilettos before women wore stilettos. She was up on the ends of those shoes yelling stupid at me and she said stupid is your name in this class now, I want you to look how the devil operates he had already been saying to me there's something wrong with you there's something wrong with you you're stupid there's something wrong with you there's something wrong with you now an authority figure stands in front of me and publicly tells me that I am stupid and that became my name in her class so every day when she called the role she said stupid Renner and I said here 
If I had a question, her answer was, stupid, do you have a question? Can anybody help stupid? And because it was the ninth grade, all the students thought that was very funny. And so guess what? I had a new name in the ninth grade. Walking down every hallway, my name was no longer Rick Renner. It was, hey, stupid. Has anybody seen stupid? Where are you going stupid? The devil pounding, 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 trying to take captive my mind from an early age. And do you know what I believe? The devil saw God's call on my life. He was after the call. Because let me tell you, if there's anything I'm not, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. But let me tell you, the devil almost had me convinced. He almost had me convinced. And then in the ninth grade, same year. They came up with this brilliant idea, it was the first time they did it in our school, to give job placement tests to the ninth graders. What ninth grader knows what he's going to do with his life? What a stupid thing to do for a ninth grader. We hardly even know how to tie our shoes in the ninth grade, and we're going to determine our profession. So I took my job placement test, came to the cafeteria to get the results from the woman who sat across the table from me. And she said, almost word for word, well, Ricky, we've looked at your tests, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I feel like I need to be honest with you. You should never go to a university in fact, maybe you shouldn't finish high school. Maybe you should go to some kind of a trade school. Now, if anybody has this job in this place, don't be offended. I'm just trying to make a point. She said, it would be best if you would think about your future being a lineman or maybe helping to lay pavement to port on roads. But you should really never think of anything much higher than that. The devil striking my mind, striking my mind. And I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any friends. What normal ninth grader wants to go to see Tchaikovsky? Who was going to go to the museum with me? I was so lonely, and that compounded everything that I felt. And I would sit on the front porch of our house with my dog, whose name was Samson, and my cat, whose name was Delilah. <laughs> and I would sit with Samson and Delilah and I would say, oh, I'm so glad you're my friends. I don't have anybody in my life. And I'm telling you, friends, this process of the devil striking the mind and striking the mind and striking the mind and striking the mind, I was under major assault. You say, oh, but Rick, you were a child. Same thing happens in adults. Same thing. And you see, when the devil is about to penetrate the mind is when he brings in reinforcements like a teacher who calls you stupid or a relative who tells you you'll never amount to anything or a bad experience which confirms everything you're already struggling with in your head. It's when the devil is assaulting the mind. That's when you have to make a decision to put something else into your brain or a stronghold is going to be built and the enemy from that place is going to start telling you what your life is going to be. Think about adultery. How does it happen? How does a committed Christian wake up? Do they just wake up and say, I'm going to commit adultery today? No. It's exactly this process. The devil begins dropping a thought into the brain, striking the brain, striking the brain. At first, the believer turns his head, but as it strikes and strikes, he begins to consider what's being said to him until finally a road is paved into his head. 
And the whole process begins until finally his brain is so confused, he justifies that he can do what he would have never even considered. Why? Because the mind has been taken captive. That's how Christians steal money. That's how Christians don't tithe. They listen to a voice that tells them you don't have to, 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 until finally they're not giving anything. They have no seed going into the ground whatsoever, and therefore they're going to live in poverty because there's nothing been put into the ground to produce a harvest. They believed a lie. How about marriage? Happy marriage. Then your wife gives you a bad look. You know, looks are very strong, wives. Wives talk without ever opening their mouths. <laughs> or the husband says something harshly, maybe not even intending to, but it's perceived as harsh. And the enemy begins to go to work in the mind. He doesn't love you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't. Uh, nobody who loves you would talk to you like that. He doesn't even know he talked to you badly. That's the thing. He doesn't even know. But the enemy has taken something that has offended you. Now is ramming it into the brain in order to begin to take you down. In 1974, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. That experience shattered. It just shattered what the devil was trying to do in my brain. The power of God came alive in me, dreams and visions for my life. And I understood that I was different because God had a different plan for my life. It was like I bypassed all that stuff the enemy was trying to do. But let me tell you something. Do you know what issues I have to deal with today? In a moment of weakness, you know what the devil does? He pulls the same cords. There's something wrong with you. You're not like other people. Why are you so different? Same cords. Denise and I live in the countryside where there's not a lot of people around us. And there are moments when loneliness absolutely engulfs me. And I become like little Ricky Renner with Samson and Delilah, wondering why I don't have anybody in my life. And the truth is, we have 3,700 people in our church every week. It is like a people conveyor coming in, going out. We are surrounded by people. And loneliness engulfs me. It's a spiritual attack. And praise God, I understand that. So what do you do in a moment like that? Well, hey, if the devil can call in reinforcements, so can I. So can I. You know what I do in a moment like that? I say, hey, Denise, I'm not thinking very good. Help me with my thoughts. I've got eight men who speak into my life, and I mean almost every day. God put them in my life to help me. If my thoughts are not thinking right, I say to them, somebody give me a good thought. When we were having to pay cash for our building last year, $5.3 million in 12 months, try to come up with that much money in 12 months. I have to tell you, I had some assaults going on in my mind saying, you're not going to make it, you're not going to make it. I said to the men in my life, tell me we're going to make it. Don't lie to me, but tell me something that's truth. I need truth. You have to call in reinforcements to help you. Now, here's the amazing thing to me. Look at my life. Where do I live? Russia. The home of Tchaikovsky. <laughs> Who am I married to? An opera singer. I own probably the largest private collection of Soviet social art in the whole of Russia, which I purchased in the early years. 
all those things that were in me is who I am at age 55. It's who I am. Isn't that amazing? And I believe that many of our dreams we have when we're children, it's really the plan of God. The plan of God, the dream of God, until life happens. And the enemy penetrates the mind and says, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. But if you didn't have that resistance, a lot of the things you dreamed when you were a child probably is what you would have and who you would be today. Isn't that amazing to me? All those same things. It's who I am. This is the way it works. It's really very simple. The devil, lamb blasting the mind, paving a road into the brain, building a stronghold from which he can dominate and rule, tell you what to think and tell you what you cannot do. becomes an oppressive force which holds you back, holds you down, so that who God called you to be is really never expressed. And then finally, you've heard the lie for so many years that you begin to think, well, it was never destined for me. It was just a dream. It could never happen. Yeah, your brains got scrambled. You've believed a lie. So if you fit into that category, and I would say 99.9% .9 of the people in the room do, we've all experienced this. What do you do? Well, first of all, you have to recognize this thing trying to beat a hole in my brain is not right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 10, verse 5. Look at it real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It says, bringing into captivity. What's next? Every what? Every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So if God says one thing about you, but another thought is trying to tell you something contrary to that, guess what? The contrary one is not right. Every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, God says you're healed. This thought says you'll never be healed. This thought says you're whole. This thought says no, 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 no. This thought says you've been given a good husband. This thought says miserable marriage. This thought says you're going to make it. God gives you hope. This thought says no, 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 you'll never have hope. It's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. You've got to bring it into captivity. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? See that phrase, bringing into captivity? I wish I had a Roman sword. You got a sword around here? You have a what? Well, I have a collection of Roman swords. So I brought one to church and I showed people how to take a thought captive. May I use you for a moment? Come on up here, Brother Mark. All right. Roman swords are very sharp. That phrase, bringing into captivity, is the word for putting the point of a sword into the back of a captive. Now, when you have a Roman sword, which is so sharp, one little jab would go all the way through the gut of that person. If I put the tip of that sword to his back and say, move, guess what? He will go anywhere I push. Do you understand? Because if he doesn't go, I will gouge him through with the sword. Do you understand? That is the word that is used here. 
It is to take captive at the tip of a sword, which means we can't just sit around and say, oh, I hope I can take this captive. We've got to get the sword out, which is the word of God, and we've got to say, I'm moving that thought. I am moving that thought right out of my life. That thought is moving, and if you're not serious about it, it won't move. Taking every thought captive and bring it into obedience. Every thought. I'm going to end with this. Five years ago, I went through a major event in my life. Events are life-changing things. I came under such attack in my mind and in my emotions. I knew that there would be no survival. There would be no survival if I didn't take action. My mind was under such attack. And I'll tell you what happened. Years and years and years of traveling and traveling and traveling and traveling and traveling and never stopping and never stopping until finally you're just a machine that moves. Eventually, everything begins to scream and shut down, and that's what happened to me. And the assault on my mind, the only way I was going to get out of that is if I built some kind of a structure to deal with my mind. So I made a commitment that I was going to get up and read my Bible every morning and I was not going to eat until first I ate the work of God. And if I didn't eat the Bible, then I would not physically eat that day. And begin to pour the Word of God into my mind. Pour the Word of God into my mind. Other thoughts were coming into my mind, so I had to choose which thoughts I'm going to listen to. I was thinking so hard. I was bending my brain so hard to the Word of God that I said to Denise, I feel like I can feel molecules moving in my brain. I, I can feel movement in my brain. And I can tell you, the Word of God was pushing something bad out, and it was beginning to replace it with something good. But I'm telling you, I had to get the spear out. I had to get out the sword and say, these thoughts are moving out of my life. And I called in reinforcements. Denise being number one, our sons number two, men of God in my life number three, who got around me and said, Rick, let's have good thoughts. Let's have right thoughts. God has used you. You're not believing right about your past. And I will tell you that my schedule today is permanently changed. It's permanently changed. If you don't give attention to your mind, if you're not putting the right thing in your mind, somebody else will. Somebody's going to control you. That's just a fact. Somebody is going to control you. So you have to decide. And I made my choice. The Word of God is going to be the number one priority in my life. I'm going to delight in His Word. He's going to show me wondrous things out of His Word. His Word brings me into a new, large place. The Word of God, when it changes the way you think, it changes what you believe. And it changes the level of supernatural. It changes what you receive. This is absolutely vital to your life. And that's why it's important that you understand the simple, simple, simple way the devil operates. And you can locate where you are anywhere along the process 
of that attack, and you can just start stepping back out of it. We had a woman in our church who, oh, Mark, I don't live in America, and I was recently rebuked for using this word, but I don't know another word. You know, everything's so politically correct. She was a schizophrenic. Is it okay to say that? I got really rebuked by somebody for using the word schizophrenic that it wasn't politically claimed. I don't know the other word to use. Multiple personalities. She came to me for counseling, and while I was talking to her, I talked to several people. Serious. I talked to several people at one time. She would come back, and I would know when it was her. And I'd talk fast. I'd say, you have, got, you have to do this. You do not have to be in this condition. You need to speak the Word of God. You need to put the Word of God in your mind. And she said, it's hard for me to do because I don't have my thoughts very long. She then went into this other personality. When she came back, we picked up where we left off. I said to her, the Word of God will correct your mind. I'm telling you, that woman goes to our church now, 10 years later. She has one mind, one voice, and I want you to think how hard it was for her. Think how hard it was for her. Multiple voices speaking and her telling them no so that she would just hear one voice, the Word of God, and the Word of God just melted her into one person. And every time I see that woman, I think if she can do that, anybody can do that. I want to pray for you, and then I want to turn this to Pastor Mark. Pastor Mark, I wanted to thank you for having us. Just reach up and put your hand on your brain. Holy Spirit, today we ask you to do brain surgery on us. We ask you, Lord, to extract. Extract those wrong things with your sharp double-edged sword. We ask you to lift your sword and extract those things which have taken us captive. And Holy Spirit, give us the fortitude we have to make the decision, but help us to make it that there will be no more authoritative voice in our life than the Word of God. Pour, pour into our brains. Save us. Help us to think with the mind of Christ. Now, right now, just say, Holy Spirit, I release your power. Move into every recess of my mind. Remove every bruise. Remove every lie. Remove the deception. Help me to think right. Bring me reinforcements. Thank you for listening to this message and for Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your word, Lord God. We take your word like medicine, Lord, and we let it work in our lives. Thank you, Father, for your good plans. We give you glory and honor. You're so good, Lord, you gave us everything we need. And we thank you for you, Holy Spirit, helping us to apply that in our lives. Bring back to our remembrance everything that we learned tonight from you, Lord God. And we can apply it, and we can help others apply it in their lives too, Lord God. And we commit to be a support for each other, Lord God, as we stand together to partake of your divine nature and let your goodness work in us, Lord. We thank you for your love. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. He's so good. He has good plans for us. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. 
tonight if you would like agreement pastor angie and i will be willing to pray with you agree with you we're each other's support we're each other's support and we can do that for each other stand together praise god hallelujah and if if you um, want to fellowship you can go um, fellowship and take some time with each other so thank you so much for coming we love you praise god glad you're here god's got good plans for us hallelujah